on a actual scale over the country. Was there. So I, after the wedding, after the reception itself, I was talking and mingling with others. And uh, the owner of uh, the largest Ford dealership, and Helen and I sat at the same table, and I quite enjoyed this company and he and his wife. And we kind of palled together. Well, he wanted to introduce me to this lady friend that he knew was, in, was single as I am. So we were standing there talking. She came late, introduced, and so we started, uh, we started chatting where she works um, in Helena uh, in the government offices. So anyway, we were chatting, and, and I said, oh, I said, I, you know, I know a fair amount of our state's representative and a few nationals. And she said, oh, who's that? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I said, I just finished um, playing at a fundraiser, and you know, I had dinner with Conrad Burns, quite enjoyed him. And she said, well, you know, he's a bit, uh, well, he's a piece of work. And I said, I said, he is definitely a politician of the old school. I quite enjoy him. And then she looked at me, her eyes got large, and I kid you not, she took three steps back and said, you're a Republican. <laughs> I said, yes, in fact, I am. And she said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you must be a very nice guy and walked away. <laughs> uh, that was it. So, uh, so that should answer both of them. Yes, I have uh, I figured a great way to start is with the tradition and the uniform in which pipers, military pipers on call, such as I am considered today, what we wear. Where the tradition comes from, uh, where the integrity of the uniform comes from. It's quite easy to you can see hundreds and hundreds of years, centuries of integrity and tradition based in one uniform that is really relatively unchanged for the last 300 years. So, I mean, certainly this uniform is not 300 years old, but components here go back better than 600 years. Um, we can go bottom to top, top to bottom. So we'll go top to bottom because I don't want to forget this wonderful thing. I'm so proud of myself for remembering going out of the house. Um, the hat that I wear is called the Glen Gary. Um, it's probably one of the newest components to the uniform that a piper wears. It goes back about 250, 300 years. Um, the hackles, which we're going to start at the real top, are made of grouse feathers. These are called piper's hackles. And only pipers to this day wear them or have ever worn. Officers are entitled to, usually they do not have respect for the piper. Um, the side badge, or clan badge, this is one of a band that I played with for a number of years. And when I left, the, I moved back to Montana. They presented it with me so it stays on this bonnet, and that's just where it stays. Now, bonnets have changed over the years. Um, bonnets considered anything that uh, the military, someone in the military, or is in old dress wears on their head. Feather bonnets are tall hats. That I did forget, sorry. Um, they're not worn indoors, they're worn outdoors. Uh, indoors only for the royal family. Not that you certainly don't require or don't deserve that. It's just I walked out of the house. And I um, hats such as this, the Glengarry. This is also a Glengarry. This is a military. This is a Pipers. The difference is the band color. These are checkered bands. So anyone else in the armed forces will wear this, including the drum corps. Pipers always wear this. They are the only ones that wear a dice bottle. As these are a dice bottle. So you see the pipers wear undiced, and you see the drummers in the drum corps with the pipers wearing this bonnet. That is tradition. Where that comes from, pipers were financed strictly by the officers in charge of the regiment at the time. Dice bonnets were more expensive than plain bonnets. Therefore, he can outfit his pipers with plain bonnets, less expensive than he can outfit them with diced. If that happened, I guess they probably better than 400 years ago, and it remains the same. It is, it is unchanged. You will see by here. And don't think that they're, they're not giving due cause to the uniform which they're wearing. You will see pipers at times wearing a dice bottle. A lot of times kids, bonnets are expensive. So they kind of get passed down and if one fits a kid or something, that's what they wear. Um, but in tradition, pipers wear no dicing on their bonnets at all. Um, this hat is called the Balmoro. This is one of the older ones. Um, these go back. Five, six hundred years. These are originally what the clansmen wore. This gives the head much more protection than does the blue Gary and Larry's. A bit more like our military caps today. You know, they're, they're there for visual usage and not really for any particular use. 
uh, these the Klansmen all wore them. Mostly the sprigs in their hats, which designate their clans as kilts, were not really registered and woven such as this one. We'll get to that in a minute. Or the tartan that the kilt was made of. Um, you've heard of the ferocity of the Scots fighting. I mean, you certainly hear the ferocity of the Highlanders. They're quite legendary throughout world history. Um, any of you have seen the movie Braveheart, you will find that those were all lowland clans, so they were nothing to mess with either. <laughs> The entire freedom of Scotland was based on the fighting the local plan. Not because the Highlands didn't want to get there, but by the time they got there, most of the fighting was already done. So it wasn't <laughs> they, were, you know, they were not there out of uh, heroic deeds. Anyway, um, the British and other forces could find when the Highlanders were ready to charge because they would reach down and pull their bonnets, this one feels tight anyway, down over their eyebrows. And they would crunch what they call crunching their bonnets. This one fits too tight for sorry shirts. Um, Anyway, in doing that, it would, the bonnet would capture right below the eyebrow and keep the eyes open. So they didn't have to worry about blinking, as it were. Really, it was more because they didn't want to lose their bonnets. <laughs> they cost money. They were hard to replace. So uh, the opposing forces could always tell when the Highlanders were ready to charge because they would scrunch their bonnets. They would all reach up and pull their bonnets down. They knew the charge was to follow the big bonnets. So, anyway, a bit of history. Now we can move from above the ears to the loaf. Um, the jacket is called the doublet, the military doublet. Pretty much anything designed to it goes back to the fighting days. Uh, the collar originally was hard leather, then it went to metal. Uh, it goes back to the days of fighting with swords to stop the blow of a sword against the one's neck. Um, as are these epaulets. Originally they were hard leather, the metal and everything else, and they were to deflect the sword's blow off the shoulder. Um, there's certainly no ornamentation now. Um, the cup, or the decoration on the sleeve, is a gauntlet of cup. It goes back to the days in which men fought with swords and their gloves had gauntlets. The big see. Now those gloves are only used for decoration and on parade. Um, you see a lot of our officers wear them. Certainly you see drum majors, you know, those are ring. Uh, all, actually, all the armed force bands, when they're in full dress, they're drum majors, the leaders will wear a gauntlet of cuffs, and it goes back to the same, same point of history. Uh, <clears throat> so I guess rank on the sleeve, since we're kind of working down, as it were, this is the rank of a pike major. It's no higher in fighting than, than the rank of a pike major. Um, it's what everyone aspires to, and after you've been in a while, you can't even reply. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's, um, Prime example, uh, Christmas Eve, we always go around and play. Um, our pipe band plays in the retirement homes, the hospitals and stuff all around Hamilton on Christmas Eve. Not dressed like this, dressed, you know, in a, in a more traditional dress. Being pipe major, I mean, I was ready 30, 40 minutes before our first game. I was the only one that was 15 minutes late because I got a phone call of, One's kilt didn't fit, another one's waist belt wasn't working right, another one. So I ended up with every member of the band, except one at my house. My kilt came off, went to another band member. I grabbed another one, put it on, took part of my uniform off to give somebody else it would fit. I grabbed another one and So the only one that was ahead on time and the only one that was late for being there. So thus is the, the life of a pet major. Uh, really, it's an over-glorified babysitting job. <laughs> and the problem is adults don't listen nearly as good as children. So. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's, uh, this is the rank, this is the badge. Uh, the rank is four stripes, chevron up. Prior to that, corporals and sergeants are all, the rank is worn high on the sleeve, not low. It goes from one to two to three, three being a sergeant, which is one under the top major. Um, really, it's a... Kind of like a vice president position, carries a, you know an awful lot of, especially in, in the pipe bands with teaching and organization, carries an awful lot of the time and concern. And then really outside of the other pipers, doesn't really get much recognition. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a shadow position as it were. Um, this red sash that you see that's worn is also the rank of a pipe sergeant. The pipe sergeant uses that rank. They're given the three chevrons. They're given a set of embroidered pipes instead of a metal pipe, which is used <coughs> for their uh, without the oak clusters around the side. And this sash. This sash stays with them forever, no matter what rank. And then uh, you'll see several bands, uh, the larger bands, 
that may have four or five pipe majors in their bands. And we'll now be able to see them by the state. It's really easy. They're ranking right? way down below. When they step out and they give that to someone else, the rank never leaves them. It always stays. Same as sergeants. Um, pipe majors still wear their sergeant sashes. It's just pretty cheap. Um, the other belt that goes across, the sword belt, actually does still carry the frog mechanism and looks to carry a full-on armored sword. It goes back to the days of fighting. Swords were worn over the shoulder because it took the load one off of the waist, or two, you could flip the belt off quickly and not lose your kill in the process. And still keep fighting. Um, so that's that's what's worn today. The waist belt that you see is uh, now more decoration than anything else. It was what kept the kilt on the wearer. Um, the kilt at the time, which was uh, referred to now as the Great Kilt or Kilo Bags, uh, was nothing more than a large piece of woven tartan material, usually about 16 inches in width and 9 yards in length. Wow. Thus the term, the whole 9 yards. The material was, a man's waist belt was laid on the ground, uh, the tartan material was placed on the waist belt and then folded over the wearer's hand. Then he would lay back on the ground, grab the waist belt, <coughs> put it on tight, then twist around, roll around until it felt kind of comfortable, stand up, and then the rest of the material is what now, this is a separate garment that we used to, or what originally formed this. If you saw the movie, um, let see, I guess, um, well, Braveheart and Rob Roy both, you saw them, you know, with the, the target material gathered up and around and pinned with a brooch. Well, at night, you would just release that brooch to the remaining material, which was from the waist belt up. The same amount of material that was from the waist belt below. They would use that to cover up. If it got very cold, they'd release the waist belt, and the material didn't get inside. It was like a sleeping bag. So that's what it was. Thus, to use up and utilize all that material, that's what started the plates in a man's kilt. So to this day, a full man's kilt is nine yards, 27 feet of material. Stretch from that door to just about where I am now. Um, so the uniforms, although very striking, <coughs> the expression cool is used a lot. They are all of that. Um, <laughs> I can promise you kilts are far warmer than trousers in the winter, and much cooler than trousers in the summer. So really, it's quite a, it's quite a remarkable garment. Um, a great many words for cloth. Um, a lot of times, the clansmen would drop their kilts. And by their, you know, they wore long shirts, which came down you know, almost to the length of their kilt. But because of the sheer weight, especially if they had been traveling a great deal in inclement weather. Kilts are made of wool. That's all they're made of. That's all they ever have been made of. Um, wool has a high percentage of lamin, so it sheds water easily. I mean, it sheds. I have one of them down for us to get home, shake them out, and hang them up and put them in the closet. I mean, they really retain very, very little water. Um, certainly the doublet or any, any part where the material can get direct rain over and over, yes, it'll soak it up just like anything else. Well, the other unique thing is it is the only natural, actually, it is the only material known to man that will keep the human body warmer, soaking wet, than it will without it. Nylon, if you're soaking wet, you better get it off your body. You're better off suffering exposure than you are with that. Well, that's not the case. You will be warmer with it, soaking wet. Um, thus, our Navy did that, and uh, the Navy uniforms were always wool. And he's thrown overboard, he's warmer with those on than he is with them on. Um, anyway, I'll get back to it. Um, like this, um, a, kind of a cute thing that goes with the sword, since we just talked, or I just talked about the sword belt, I'm the most talking to you most of this. Um, <laughs> as in tradition with, with pipe bands, and, and now that you have a spattering of, of the history in a few minutes, um, the drum major is the guy that looks like the fellow that's on the Duane's <coughs> whiskey bottle, you know, full feather bonnet, he walks with a mace. Okay, he is a drum major. If there is a drum major, the drum major will call out the tunes. If not, the pipe major does. The pipe major always stands at the right front column. Always. The bank of pipers, the pipe major, will always be in the right corner. The pipe sergeant will be in the left corner. That goes back, so as the pipe major goes to call it out, he may say, you know, um, back, Scotland, break, twice, through, by my count, quick march, or by the right, quick march. 
What he said in that is he's told what tune he wants played, how many times he wants played, what the cadence is, and on whose count, which is his. By the right, which means I'm standing in the right. If it's the pipe sergeant would call it, he would say by the left. If the drum major, he would say by the center, because he always marched in the center. The reason pipe majors always stand on the right front column goes back to the days of fighting with swords. It's a place of honor. Um, way back when, um, Fighting in line. The weakest side was your right arm. Your shield kept the left part of your body. So the swordsman to your right actually protected your right arm. <laughs> and then the soldier to his right, etc. etc. All the way to you get to the end. The last guy at the end has no protection on his right side. On his arm on its side, he has no protection. Thus, the finest swordsman was always at the right. So, just kind of like in piping or in other organizations, you get promoted absolutely to the worst possible position you could. And that was the case. You were the absolute best good. You get the most dangerous position you could run. So, that's, uh, but anyway, to this day, that is what like, made your stand in the band, and it goes all the way back to you know, the 1300s, fighting swords and the battle. Okay, let's see, what have I missed? Um, uh, this component to the, the jacket originally was, was hard leather or metal. Uh, again, it was, uh, it was hinged at the waistline so it would move, you know, as, as the wearer would move. But it was designed to stop blows. Now it's where we have our pockets and hide our stuff. Because kilts, although a, an incredibly useful garment, have no pockets. So we have to stick things all the rest of our uniform, in our socks, you know. And <laughs> So it, uh, yeah, when you come over wearing a kilt, you don't spend much time in your pockets. So. Uh, anyway, the, the sporin, um, which is this component that's worn in the front, this is a piper's sporin or an officer's sporin. Only the bands wear horsehair sporin. Um, certainly in, in, in dress, uh, fancy dress to the thing, you will see a lot of them, a lot of very old, famous ones. Uniform-wise, they're only worn by pipers and officers. The drummers will wear them only playing in the core with the pipers. That's the only time that they're worn. Uh, the horsehair sporins are not so much useful as they are designation of rank or position. The clan chiefs originally would have them. It would, it would uh, designate them from the rest from a far distance quickly. Uh, originally, the sporin was a soft leather bag tied in the, just tied in the front. And it was used primarily to carry the porridge. Trail mix, if you will. Uh, the reason it's worn on the front and not on the side is with it on the front, you can run. On the side, it bangs. But you can take off in full flight of running. And as you run, your legs will keep it airborne. So there's, you know, there's no problem. Um, and it puts the load on the small of your back, which is a lot easier to carry than it would be off the ATF or whatever else. Uh, so even though it's a lot of flash today in this type of uniform, its original usage was it was a lunch pail. I mean that's really that's really what it was used for. Okay, the kilt, the garment underneath the sporn. Um, we've touched on parts of it. It's original, you know how it came about in that the kilt and the plate, such as this, were one garment. Um, uh, the kilt is, like I said, a very useful garment. They are expensive. It takes uh, today a top kilt maker 16 to 18 hours of fast work to make a man's kilt. And this is somebody that's been making kilts 20 or 30 years. I mean, it's a very labor intensive and it truly is a labor of love that they do it. It is all done by hand <coughs> to this day. There's nothing that can be done in a man's kilt by machine. There are no patterns for it. It is done strictly by mathematics. The kilt maker is given three measurements. Um, Waist, hip, and length. That's it. And based on that, they will produce the garment that will fit that. Um, most kilts are custom made for the wearer. Today's market, they run probably for four hundred and fifty dollars. In fair warning, I have a friend that wears his great great grandfather, who's one hundred and thirty five years old. So as long as you can keep them from tearing or keep them from moths, they will last you know, an awful long time. I don't know about you, but I don't think there's many garments that you'll find in someone's household that they've been wearing steady for 20 or 30 years. I have several. So, and believe me, my kids get a lot of usage. Um, 
the, the kilt today that I'm wearing that you've seen, that we all see, is called the little kilt. It was separated from the total, the whole garment was separated. The plate was taken off, and the little kilt was from the waist to the knee. Uh, that goes back to the days uh, when a great many Scots worked in the iron mill in England. Um, they would not work in trousers. There was nothing more unmasculine than wearing trousers. I mean, that was really not thought highly of. Um, anyway, because of all this material around, you know, on Scots that would get lit on fire as they would go by the kilns and stuff. So, actually, it was one English foreman that struck a deal with the Scots that were working. He said, you can wear your kilts, but you have to get rid of all this upper material. And so they did. So they wore their garment from the waist belt to their knee. To this day, that is the way it has been. Um, thus, the plaid component of this uniform, which is this, is woven of the same material as the kilt. Um, the plaid is really where kind of the bastardized term plaid comes into effect. Uh, tartan is what I am wearing. Plaid is intersection of lines that has no registry. They're pretty. I mean, they're beautiful. Tartans are registered, just like family crests, just like names, just like copyrights on books and songs. I mean, they are registered, and they are registered to the thread count. Um, you can see a great many, uh, a great many different variations of the same tartan, and all are exactly right. It's done by the counts of the threads. You know, there's like 36 green threads intersected by 15 white threads intersected by three yellow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So depending on the thread width. And the color of the thread at the time, whether it's a bright red or a dull red or a bright green or a dark green, just has to do with what happened to go on the loom at the time. It's actually the count of the threads and how they're put together that's registered. Um, this tartan is the McLean of Dewart, which is our band's tartan. Last time, those of you that were here, I wore my family tartan, which was Hamilton. Uh, the red was actually, the bright red tartans were. Can, Go back really to about the 17, 1800s when the British finally took over the rule of the Scots, the English. Um, and I mean no disrespect by anybody in this room of you know of English heritage. I have some in myself as well. Um, however, you know just kind of like here in America, I mean our past history with English doesn't sit real well with the Scots. I've been fighting it out 600 years before we became a country. So, you know, it's, uh, uh, Anyway, they added the red to the tartans. The original tartans were always green, blue, browns, small bits of white, small bits of yellow. The idea, well, well one, they only had uh, those kinds of dyes because they were readily available. And uh, two, the object was not to be seen when you went into the forest. The object was to be covert, undercover, and camouflage. So you, know, you really didn't want to make a target for your enemy. You kind of wanted to just vanish in the mist, as it were. Um, so the red with the, the the history and the pomp and the circumstance of you know, the English and their regiments and stuff, the red coats, etc. Um, that is where that got added into the tartans. McLean Dewart also comes in what they call hunting or a, uh, an original tartan, which is done in greens and the red is taken out and it's substituted with the green. Um, however, for bands, people like to see the flash and the dash, so, and it, and it really does. Um, kilt pin. This is now strictly worn by ornamentation. Uh, the first kilt pin worn on a kilt was a gift of um, Queen Victoria to a very young and tremendously embarrassed corporal that was standing at the far right of a line. Had been waiting on parade for hours for the royal family to show up, and the winds had come up, and they were fierce. And it was raising havoc with this poor young corporal's kilt. Well, you can uh, kilt's apron always from left to right. So we reapron this way, the under apron goes the opposite. So although there is two folds of material, wind being as it may, can really can raise havoc with a man's kilt. Uh, and this poor young corporal could not move. And the queen saw this. She came over, actually took the <coughs> pin out of her hat, and pinned the two aprons of the kilt together to stop that from happening. So actually that regiment, which was the Royal Scots, was the first to ever wear a kilt pin. Now it's more than pretty much for ornamentation. And it adds a little weight to that corner of the kilt, so it does help a bit. <laughs> 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 um, 
Uh, okay, so now we've gotten to the knees and anyway, below the knees. Uh, the hose tops that you see here are uh, uh, Titan hose tops. They are, uh, many of you may be familiar with the term Argyle, Argyle socks. Okay, that comes from exactly these. In, in Scotland, uh, as we refer to our armed forces, they refer to them as Argyles. So you can, uh, now there are only two Argyles. There's the Highland Argyle and the Lowland, and the Lowland Argyle. There were as many as, at one time, probably better than 50. A lot of dukes, a lot of earls and stuff were asked to raise their own army. And they would, thus, you know, the Northern Highlanders and stuff were raised by the Duke of Gordon um, and financed by him. He dressed them the way in which he wanted, but they were his Argyle. Um, the Black Watch, to this day, the <coughs> majority of uh, the members of the Black Watch come from one small district of Scotland, because that is heritage, that is where they came from. That was their Argyle. Well, a lot of the regiments, the Scottish regiments, all wear the same tartan. Black Watch is a familiar tartan. Stuart is another tartan. Royal Stuart is another. Um, so really, the only differentiation between one Argyle and another is their host tops. Some are white and red, such as this. Some are green and red. Some are green and white. Some are red and black. Some are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's many combinations. So you could actually tell what Argyle somebody belonged to by looking at their host tops. And that's how they would differentiate each other. Oh, I see you're a Seaforth Highlander. So actually, they're not called Argyles. It is the Argyles that wore different colored um, The little flashes that you see underneath, originally before the advent of wool such as it is, they fall down. So um, the original socks, um, hose as we call them, or hose tops such as these are, um, would be pulled up and a ribbon would be tied above the calf because then it can't fall down, you know, where your calf goes into your knee and the So um, these are still worn today, mostly for that reason. They're made of elastic. You don't have to hand tie them anymore. But oftentimes they were ribbons, you know, usually of a sister, girlfriend, wife, loved one, mother. And, you know, we give them the ribbons and that's what they would tie with. What is stuck in the top of my right sock, now in hand, is a small knife called the skin U. Skin meaning knife, do meaning black. It doesn't, although most of the handles were carved of ebony and African blackwood, such as this one is, same material the bagpipes are made of. Very tough and durable wood. Um, that's not where it gets its name. It gets its name from black as in covert, undercover, hidden. Oftentimes it was worn you know, in the back, underneath the belt. It was hidden you know, up a sleeve. It was stuck inside a sword belt. It was hidden in a plate. It was like our Derringer was in the early days of American history. It was the one weapon that one kept secure and covered. Um, it became, uh, was not considered proper in which not to reveal all your weapon to you if you were in someone's home, if you're in a public establishment such as this, you know, if you were in the pub at night, which you were um, So they would take, they would take their steam bees out and they would set them on the table, put them on their lap. Swords, Thurks, shields were all checked at the door. You know, they were just stacked in big piles. But this had to be shown. <coughs> so I guess nobody really knows, although it's been about 350 years that we've worn them in the hose tops, where that came about. Some say it had to do with the kilt was separated from the fill bags to the small kilt, so there was not all the tartan material that was always there to stick them in the folds of. The one that I think I am a little more um, I believe in was, uh, I think there were a great many skin views left on the table at the pubs at night when they walked away. You know, one too many pints and you forget to oh, yeah, grab that. So you can take them out, you can stick them in your hose top. They were still seen, but they were still connected to your body. So that's the one I tend to agree with, knowing the famous history of the Scots as I do. I would think that libations probably had a more history than that. <laughs> <laughs> the spats? are very common, you know, in the Scottish Army and other armies throughout the world. They go back to the time of, uh, in short, for spider leggings, which was um, pieces of linen that soldiers would actually tie their shoes onto their feet, loop underneath, and actually wind up and added that. Uh, it gave some protection, but also gave a lot of strength to the lower part of the leg. I mean, this was at times, you know, when it was not uncommon for armies to actually physically march 30 and 40 miles a day. They did anything. That's where it goes back to 
shoes underneath. Um, the Scottish do have a traditional shoe. It's called a gilly bro. Um, it is the advent of our wingtips. The wingtip shoes, so famous by lawyers and bankers and whatnot, were really nothing more than the Scottish working man's shoe. <laughs> Thus the reason for, if you look at a wingtip, you'll find double leather on the toe, double leather on the heel, double leather on the sides. Now in wingtips, you used to go all the way through. And that's because Scotland is not noted for its warm, dry climate. It's noted for its very wet and marsh climate. So as they would walk through streams and in the marsh with the holes, water would go in the shoe, water would go out of the shoe. The, the shoes originally had no tongues. And uh, where the lacings are now, they were actually castellated like this, the lacings on the larger loops. Um, the reason the Scots tie them, if you've ever seen them, I can't do with spats because it's all tied underneath. But uh, they're crisscrossed and the, the knot is actually tied about here on the leg. It's not tied on the shoe itself. Reason for that is you can kick your shoes off <coughs> while you're walking, climb up the rocks with your toes, and you not lose your shoes. They would just dangle around behind you. So there's absolutely a reason that everything is in the uniform, as there is so much in our uniforms today. I don't know, have I left anything out of the uniform? I know I'm trying to talk as fast as I can. I want to ask a question. Uh, on television or in person, we see uh, uh, pipe bands, let's say, from the New York Police Department. Mm -hmm. Now, most of those people are, are, I would think, are Irish. Are they mimicking, in, in their dress, are they mimicking you, or do they have a separate tradition in the way that they dress and so forth? Um, I'm not really quite so certain that I understand the question entirely. Um, most pipe bands are Scottish. Really? Yeah, you know, I, I, I always think of those of those pipe bands being Irish. Most do. Um, however, uh, the pipes such as we play and I'll play here shortly are Scottish. The Irish do have a traditional pipe. The Scots are not um, good lead into this. The Scots are not the founders of the pipe. Actually, it's it's believed that it's actually Egyptian, um, as was found. Well, it was probably about 10 years ago, there was a small, very small set of pipes that <coughs> operates on the same principle of, of the Highland pipes. Um, it was found in the tomb of a very young pharaoh in Egypt. So really, it was probably the Egyptians, you know, then probably adapted by the Romans, and I'm certain that the Romans are what brought them to the British Isles. Um, I mean, you know, the <laughs> Hadrian was smart enough after fighting and fighting and fighting against the Northumberland or the north part of England, he finally figured there's no way in the world we can conquer these Scots. They make no sense. They fight, you know, when they want to, and they don't when they want to. So he actually built a wall all the way across the country of England, which you can still see today, called Hadrian's Wall. It was heavily armed and fortified. Scots, you stay on that side, we stay on this side. That's it. You know, the emperor was tired of losing soldiers and spending money and everything else. So I would say that it was probably he or the Roman armies that brought the pipes to Scotland. Scotland did not invent them. You know, nor rashly did anyone in, in Europe do that. The Scots just kind of became the keeper of them, as it were. The Poles had them during the Renaissance. It was quite popular. The Poles had them, the Swiss had them, the Italians had them, the Irish had them. Um, the Irish still today have a traditional Irish pipe. It carries two drones instead of three. The bass drone is an octave. It's a half an octave lower. The tenor drone is a half an octave higher. And the chanter is very short and very high pitched, even higher pitched than ours, which I find. Um, and most of the tunes that you hear on there are very quick fingering, you know, the jigs and stuff like that. Um, so really to answer your question, most pipe bands are Scottish. Um, they are, uh, certainly my own, what kept them alive was the Scottish military. I mean, that was what funded, you know, most of the pipe bands. Now, and it's also the demise of the bands because of the tremendous expense. Um, Currently, the world champion, actually two times in a row, is from Canada right now, Simon Fraser University, two times world champion. The one that I don't know that will ever be beat was actually financed by um, the Strathclyde Police, Strathclyde Scotland. They were the first band and the only one I know of in history since the world competitions um, that won seven consecutive world championships. And now they aren't more. So, uh, you know, I can remember, gosh, I can remember as a kid, you know, when they won four in a row, I mean, gosh, that's amazing. No one had ever heard of that. 
I mean, there had been bands that had won four world competitions, but four in a row was just incredible. And if you have ever seen what pipers go through and stuff to win one of those, it is incredible. I mean, it is incredible. You get at least 16 pipers to sound like one, and you get at least six drummers to sound like one. And you can't have a reed falter, you can't have a finger fail. I mean, it's, you know, you're talking the best of the best of the best of the world. And these guys have managed to amass that for seven years consecutively. And now they are no more. I mean, they're not even a grade four band. They're just gone. They're just gone. Let me interrupt one, one minute. We do have to feel like have to leave. Let's do our drawing real quick. Why don't we have that gentleman there? <laughs> they carried none. They were in part of the ambulance crew. Uh, first of all, the world was the last time that saw a tremendous amount. Most pipers will probably have better than 2,000 hours of practice in before they can play one or two tunes. It's very good. A very famous tune, I'll play it for you in a minute, Scotland the Brave. That sounds like the old Spice commercial. Um, it's a really tremendous tune. Um, it would take a good three-year piper, probably 30 hours of practice, to get that tune down to be able to play it okay in front of people for the first time. So, um, you know, piper spent a lot of time. The absolute finest description of what it takes to make a piper is that, uh, and it was written by John Monroe, um, back in the 1800s. And he said, to the making of a piper, it goes seven years of his own time, and seven generations before. <laughs> At the end of that seventh year, lending a fond ear to the drum, he may then stand at the threshold of knowledge and parley with old folks of old times. That's about it. Scottish Highland pipes. Um, it's composed of three drones, Bass drone, which I'm holding in my hand, two tenor drones, which are below. Uh, tenor drones are tuned to low A on this chanter, we'll give that a minute. Bass drone is tuned one octave lower. It's tuned sharp and flat by sliding these slides in and out. Excuse me. Um, the best pipes, and even to this day, um, are made of African blackwood. Which is, there are some pipes that are made of Delron, which is the material that this chanter is made out of. Very durable. Um, it's not conducive to moisture, whether uh, too much or lack of is really the biggest problem that we're faced with here in Montana because it's so dry. Um, this set of pipes, just to let you know, is about probably 75 years old. Um, this set was a gift to me, which is wonderful. I, and I'm the first piper that ever played them. I mean, to, for a piper to receive one, to get a set of Andersons, which is this. He was a legendary pipe maker. Uh, Henderson sold it to Hardy which is the maker of the first set, and the only other set of pipes that I own. Uh, he sold it as uh, eight holes, nine notes. That's all the notes are. That's all there are in Highland pipes. So uh, a great many tunes cannot be adapted to the pipes because that's all we have is nine notes. Unlike a guitar, which has infinite notes, we have nine, and that's that. This other component is the blow stick. This is what the piper uses to get air from their mouth, lungs into the bag. The bag is, is a two-fold usage. Um, the bag material itself can be made of numerous things. This one is made of cowhide. It's in here somewhere. Sheepskin is used quite a lot for pipers that play an enormous amount or live in a humid climate, such as Scotland or um, anywhere in the tropics. Montana, we're not faced with them abundance of moisture in our hair, so um, it's actually a lot of work to just be playing a leather bag. We have to season it. If they're not played a lot, we have to season it constantly. Mm -hmm. Another material that's used with tremendous satisfaction is Gore-Tex, the same material that Bulletproof mm -hmm. Vests are made out of. It's woven into a thin material. It's great. It's durable. It doesn't, it's impervious to moisture. It's impervious to leakage, with the exception of where they attach to the drones. So oddly enough, the material itself is almost not Bulletproof. Uh, the connection is a vulcanized rubber, and they don't last as long as leather bags. I played one leather bag I've been playing. The chatter is that like an oboe. It's a double, double cane reed. Um, there has been no luck to create a synthetic reed, and believe me, many have tried. I've played many, and they don't work. Cane is the only material that's used. The, um, the drone reeds, um, I have a couple I can pass around. You
Mm. It's a much easier game to pull this out. You can practice. You can do this check a lot at night, not with a thousand pipes. Another story. 